Hello and welcome to the Be Free podcast. So this is the second in our sober mini series. And um, uh, last week we had my darling husband on, Stuart McWilliam. And this week we have him back, but he's going to interview me and ask me about my sober experience. Um, now, I, ha- I was just going to record this podcast myself, but I actually had a couple of you message me and say that you loved um, the dynamic of the Stuart and I. And uh, that's not the first time that's been said, eh, Stu? Hello? Yeah. <laughs> Going back to our... Um... Yes, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah. Our live... Okay, experience. sorry. Yes, indeed, I... Uh, our COVID experiences. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I had a couple of people message me and say that they would like you to interview me and ask me the questions. So you have kindly agreed. And Stuart is the king of interviewing, given that he has been in recruitment for thirty-five years. Approximately, yes. <laughs> Not giving away your age, my darling. Quite a journey. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Cool. So yeah. So shall we just fight away? Do you want to just uh, take me through? Um, I I am so sorry. Just to actually to interject before we start, I have to say thank you to those of you who've reached out to me, even people that I've just met randomly who listen to the podcast. Um, and it really has opened up some conversation. Your discussion last week, Stu. So everyone's so grateful for your vulnerability, and um, yeah, it's like. It's amazing how many people I never knew were sober um, have come up to me and told me that um, they, they a little bit about their sober journey. So it really is fascinating. Um, and I hope that the listeners get a lot from today's and the upcoming uh, sessions as well. Yeah, I can agree with that um, because I've had a couple of people that um, also, uh, from a male perspective, I think it's a bit more difficult for uh, opening up uh, from that perspective. And a, a few people come to me um with a a, a struggle uh, that I never knew anything about uh, before so um I think that uh, opening yourself up being vulnerable um displaying you know the fact of gratitude uh, for the experience that you've had uh, being able to touch other people uh, was uh, what we were trying to do and uh, so hopefully that's worked so far and uh, may actually extend even further so perfect thank you Okay, do you want to fight away? Ask me the questions I asked you. Okay, so we don't do we need to say who are you, who you are? Okay, what you're well, about? for anybody listening, let's go anybody for the first time. This? Yes, indeed. So, um, share who, who are you, please? Okay, so I'm Susie McWilliam. I am a coach, author, teacher, healer, guide. Um, I really love to support and empower people to connect with any form of natural healing. Um, I specialize in meditation and working with the cycles of life and nature and just really allowing people to really align with their purpose and connection to life. I am a mama to three. I have two beautiful stepchildren who are in their 20s and a teenager. Um, We have family experience of ADHD and life on the spectrum. And um, yeah, like friend, nature lover, animal lover, crystal lover, central oil lover, uh, plants, trees are my thing. Excellent. Um, well, thank you for inviting me to be on the other side of the uh, the table uh, on this occasion. Um, so let's kick off with how and why did you decide to become alcohol free? Okay, so I guess my journey started, um, many people who follow this podcast will know that I had previous struggles with anxiety um, and depression. And um, like the early part of my life, I was like quite a big party animal and drinker. And uh, it was like a huge part of my social self and even my identity. Like I was like, you know, the party creator 
you know, the initiator, the bully, the bullier of others to drink alcohol. Um, and then as kind of life progressed, I found like the hangovers were getting so bad. Like my anxiety the next day was just awful and it would write off like days. Um, and I really didn't enjoy that. Uh, sometimes I would like uh, experience blackouts, which was, you know, pretty horrific and horrible. Um, and I started to cut back on alcohol. So, you know, we'd, Stuart and I had done a number of like cleanses and stuff. We'd done like dry January and all those things. And would like felt so much better and cleaner when I was doing that. And then... Yeah, so I started to cut back on alcohol and I would buy myself like mini bottles of Prosecco. Do you remember this? Yeah. Because <laughs> I'd like open a big bottle of Prosecco and I'd be like, I don't really don't want the whole thing. I just wanted like a glass, which of course at that point, Stuart didn't understand at all. He's like, how can you open a bottle of wine and not want to finish it? So I decided like. uh, to buy like little mini bottles of Prosecco because I convinced myself that if I drank Prosecco, champagne or gin, that was like the three choices at the end. Um, that I wouldn't have a hangover and it would have to be high quality spirits as well you know um, so I did that and then it was just getting like less and less my mom had been diagnosed with terminal cancer and I was kind of visiting her every like every day and um, like it seems weird but like my husband Stuart my husband Stuart was going through his own kind of mental health challenges and um issues in and around alcohol and it just really wasn't serving me I found myself getting annoyed when I was drinking emotional um and it was just kind of putting I don't know like skewing everything up like it just everything was a bit blurry um and the final straw for me with the alcohol was it was my birthday and I was doing a speaking event um, for doTERRA and I was on stage and I was it was like my birthday weekend and we'd arranged to meet people afterwards. I hadn't really eaten all day and um, we went out for dinner and um, I think you and I had had a bit of an argument as well because you weren't quite in the right headspace. And um, we went out for dinner. I drank so much on an empty stomach. I invited everyone back to our house for a party that I can't remember. And um, it was also mother. This was like must have been a Saturday. It was Mother's Day on the Sunday. We'd arranged to go out for dinner with my dad. Um, and I remember like waking up and just feeling so ill, like. I, like I was like shaking I felt sick my anxiety was through the roof and I remember my dad saying where do you want to go for Mother's Day let's all go like go out and I wanted to go to it's like a local baker's and have a tuna sandwich like that was like all I was capable of and um like I just remember feeling so much shame and guilt that it was like Mother's Day and like you obviously Lily was quite small at the time and just thinking what an absolute shambles like it just d felt awful and that was the last time because I thought I'd already been cutting back before that and I just yeah. thought you know what it's just not worth it mm -hmm. yeah I remember that time <laughs> yeah experiences uh -huh. I think it's important that uh, whilst they're painful to remember uh, they're also important to remember Mm -hmm. uh, to remind you of the course that you've taken mm -hmm. uh, as well. So, I mean, how did you find it initially when you... I think for me... That kind of behaviour, if you like. Yeah, I think for me, like, I... And I've discussed this with a few people who've asked me this before. It, for me, it got to a point where I was already cutting back. I knew it wasn't aligning anymore. Like, as I mentioned, like, my mum was ill... I wanted to be really present for all the emotions that were coming up because I've seen so many people kind of lose it to alcohol over grief. And um, I didn't want to be that person. And I wanted to be able to drive and like, you know, at yeah. a moment's notice if I wanted to. Um, but the one thing for me was I used to always love a drink at like, say, five, six o'clock at night. Like it would probably be like, just before you got home from work 
I'd be dealing with kids or whatever, like, it, you know, making dinner, like you kind of nearly got to the end of the day. And I'd be like, oh God, I could really go a glass of wine. But actually, if I waited and that passed, I didn't need it. So I think it's like recognizing your like triggers. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so yeah. Recognizing the trigger points, like when you're reaching for a wine, is it just like a social thing or are you using it as a crutch? Um. So yeah, sorry. What was the question? The challenges. You know, how did you find it initially when you actually stopped mm. that behavior of drinking to not being a drinker? Yeah, because that's I, that's 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 a change, isn't it? It's a transition. Yeah, I I think my transition was longer. It wasn't just like yeah. as yeah. I said, like although I did have that one night where I was like, oh god, no more. Like I mean, I'd I'd had many nights where I was woken up and thought, oh god, not again. But like I think like the transition uh, was so grad, like it was gradual for me that I hadn't, I wasn't then like drinking on a Friday Saturday night. I hadn't been doing that for months. So yeah, so it wasn't like a just a sharp yeah, spot so for me it was probably just that gradual process of cutting back and cutting down to the point where I thought you know what it's actually not worth it yeah so I suppose that you use the term there uh, triggers um so in terms of challenges it's it's understanding you know what is the trigger and trying to um uh you know, manage those triggers if you can or change them perhaps maybe yeah, I think it's just changing the behavior. You know, it's the same when yeah. like you're kind of stopping smoking or something like that. If you're using it in that way, like, you know, what can you do instead of the times that you would normally go for a smoke? Or like, you know, is it go for mm -hmm. a walk? Is it meditate? Is it what like take a few deep breaths? I don't know, like dance, shake it off, whatever it is. Yeah. I mean, at what point did you? start recognizing that you weren't a drinker that something else was you know your life yeah I think that's a real tough one because as I mentioned like obviously mom had passed and then like I remember thinking at the like funeral and stuff like I don't think I was drinking at her funeral like I don't think um I can't remember all the dates of everything that year was a bit of a blur but like I do just I don't know like yeah going on functions and stuff I guess like um having my 40th birthday actually um I wasn't drinking on my 40th birthday and that was a big one like just um you know, it's something that would be classed as like a major like life event. I would normally have had uh -huh. like yeah. big like shindig, organized malt pull nights out and dinners. And I just really wasn't like in that headspace. I was just like, no, I want to have a really nice connection. Remember the conversations I'm having with people, enjoy good food, spend quality time with people. It was just like the whole focus had shifted. Yeah. Plus, plus you'd also had quite a big change in terms of you'd moved house mm. you bought land mm -hmm. you had the um you know the dream of you know having your horses at home getting stables getting your work when you land and all that so that was that something that would have helped you in that time? um yeah i don't think it like it didn't um I think the stopping drinking probably accelerated all those things and that i had the clarity to like drive ahead and you know look into planning permission create this new business create this new lifestyle like I probably wouldn't have had the like it would have happened as quickly maybe and as focused yeah so is that, that that's what you know is that what's blossomed from your experience of changing from drinking to not drinking I think so much has blossomed like I just yeah. freaking love my mornings like you know that like I could just spend hours by myself yeah. in the morning. I yeah. love waking up with a clear head. I love waking up with choice. Um, I just, I love the clarity. Like I probably, like I know you've said to me many times at like social occasions like and things like, well, you can just have a glass of wine if you want or, you know, a glass of it. It's just because I'm not drinking, you don't have to. And that wasn't really 
why I stopped. Uh-huh. Like I wasn't stopping because like I felt like I had to for you. Yeah. Like I felt I felt I stopped drinking because I felt better. And I dread to think like how like coping with perimenopause with alcohol, like Jesus, like the anxiety and stuff's been bad enough. So the thought of layering stuff that's going to mess with my mind, I'm just really not up for that. That's quite powerful and very, very strong to be able to, you know, recognize, identify and then decide, follow through. With that, I mean, how did how did, I mean, how did you manage to do that then? Just to stop drinking. Yeah. I don't As know. I think it's just like something happening, like in my incident, something, you know, it like it was a brick wall that that was hit. Therefore, decisions were made, but yours wasn't. It was a a, a decision that you made along the way if you like yeah I guess I had to be strong through that situation that you were experiencing like I uh-huh. had to be strong for my kids oh I'm gonna get more still yeah I had to be strong for the kids and I had to be strong for myself and I had to be really conscious of everything that was going on in my life like what was you know not kind of checking on you, but like, okay, what is going yeah. on with yeah. you? Because I'm not going to let anything um, possibly mess up my kids or my life. Yeah. So from your perspective then, uh, you know, anybody who's kind of listening or watching this here um, that would like to um to stop, not because they necessarily have to, but they think it might be better for them health-wise and make it feel better. What kind of tips might you be able to share with them? I think it's maybe like, one of the things that I used to like doing was just like writing a list, and I do this with clients a lot, writing a list of all the things that bring you joy, right? Like all the things that you love doing, have loved doing, places you want to go, people you want to hang out with, things you want to do, things you want to achieve, like, and start actioning them. Like, realise that you have the potential to go and do these joyful things, to, um, yeah, have real conscious, deep relationships. Um, one thing, and I don't know if we will touch on it, I know when I first stopped drinking, actually, we spoke about challenges, was um, I felt like I lost a lot of friends at that time um or wasn't invited to things potentially um, yes that's right i remember that yeah and i remember yeah. like thinking well what difference does it make whether i'm drinking or not drinking like i can still go to those things and i'm still the same person but yeah that was a little bit challenging yeah it's interesting that as well because you try and that that could make you feel lonely. That could make you feel, you know, left out. That could make you feel pushed out and all that kind of stuff. And it's quite possible people may be just thinking, well, because you don't, we don't want to kind of put you in that position, perhaps, maybe, or we don't want to make you feel uncomfortable, uh, et cetera. So it's quite interesting how, again, if anybody who's listening, if they feel that way, what might they want to think? Yeah, I think it's just finding like like as I mentioned, the things that bring you joy, the hobbies, um, and maybe inviting your friends along on those things. Like I've got I'm so fortunate that I have the most incredible friends. And um a lot of my friends now aren't really interested in drinking, which I think is funny because yeah. we were all like big partiers. Um so we'll go and do different stuff, like go for a hike or um just like yeah, do different things mm-hmm. together. Sure. I suppose it's in, in identifying within yourself as well um, what excites you and gives you enjoyment. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So I know your podcast is all, it's kind of fueled around being free and open and, you know, allowing, you know, to experience all the sensations and stuff like that. So 
uh, I think I maybe know the answer. I think you maybe already said it, but you know, <laughs> what are the things that make you feel free these days? Yeah. Oh my God. White space in my diary, like <laughs> clear diary. Jesus, it gives me life. Like, <laughs> so I've spent so much of my life over scheduling, and now I'm so conscious about free space, free time. Um, you'll know this like I don't thrive when I've got time scales to keep to like if I've got an appointment at 10 an appointment at 12 30 and like I much rather like to flow with my day um still accomplish things but yeah so having that being in nature as soon as my feet and nostrils get a whiff of a beach I'm like <laughs> come back to life <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, and yeah, the same, just nature mostly for me makes me feel free. And has it impacted or have you identified your know, values that you've realized are really important to you? Yeah, I'm very conscious about living in alignment with my values, freedom being one of them, hence the kind of um asking of that. And you know, that's why when I work with my clients and coaching point of view, that's one of the one of the first things we look at is their values and are they living in alignment with them so yeah for me um you know freedom joy beauty um connection creativity um yeah independence are all really really important to me and it will be different for everybody eh? and i think that's what people need to re recognize that you don't just do what someone else has done to achieve what they've done is to really find out what excites and makes them happy and for them to pursue that themselves. Yeah, 100%. If it has to be that. authentic and it has to be what drives you. And um, yeah, I, I studied a course in acceptance and commitment therapy, which was a really incredible program. And I do want to kind of weave more of that into my work. But the basis of, of that is living in accordance with your values and you can do that at any point in your life regardless of what's going on um mm -hmm. and living this life of meaning so yeah i think everybody ha it's so important people learn how to identify their own values definitely so in terms of that wonderful fabulous information so if md um is maybe experiencing this situation or position they find themselves in the moment how can they connect with you um in terms of if they would want to kind of you know reach out to you for example i mean how how can they get to uh, get to connect with you yeah drop me a message i bloody love a voice note so feel free to, Don't to, you? Voice, to <laughs> voice note me on instagram or facebook um or you know if you want to email you can email me all of those things um and yeah like I, i've got so many different kind of strings to my bow i know i need to communicate it more effectively but i really like to work with people in quite a bespoke way um so yeah if anybody wants to ask me any questions about the things i've discussed like absolutely feel free to reach out the other thing i would say if anybody is um living with a partner or friend who is experiencing alcoholism like the group Al-Anon, I went to that support group and they were incredible and um, they supported me through, yeah, really challenging time and yeah, beautiful, beautiful. And how, uh, so who, who is that organisation? Where, where might somebody find them? So they're like, they're based in and around, I, th I think they're actually international, but if you are based in the UK, there is a website for Al-Anon um for the UK and Ireland and you can just go in there and it just shares all the meeting times and locations they're they're all over the place so there's lots of opportunities for people to connect right okay excellent so um thank you very much Dee, for inviting me and offering me the opportunity to uh, to interview <laughs> you from that perspective um which is quite challenging itself, uh, yeah. you know, having been party to, uh, you know, the experiences. Mm -hmm. um, but is there anything else that you you feel might be important to add or to share or? Yeah, I mean, I think like this conversation can sound quite heavy, but actually, it's freaking magical being alcohol free. 
Like, you, like you know, like, yeah, I mean, like, there's so much joy in being alcohol free. There's like, and I think nowadays it's so much easier. There's like a lot less judgment. There's so many alcohol free beers, wine, spirits, drink, you yeah. know, like, um, it's not even a just it's not even a thing like I don't like no. before it would have been like and I was uh, somebody had messaged me about this and we were chatting and um I'd said how I once dated this guy years ago who was alcohol free and I remember thinking oh my god what a weirdo like I can't go out with this guy like how could I go out with somebody who doesn't drink like he's obviously got issues and uh nowadays I don't even think that's the case like it can just be like the most incredible lifestyle choice to serve yourself and I think anybody who is into self-improvement and doing spiritual development work you know I would suggest you try like even if it's a week alcohol free to see the difference in your cognition your connection to source to spirit because you will be a cleaner cleaner channel and vessel. Wonderful. Susie McWilliam, extraordinaire. Thank you very much indeed. Um, yeah. And uh, hopefully we'll speak again very soon. When I come downstairs. When you come downstairs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Stu. You're um, welcome. Thank you. Next appreciate week. the opportunity. Oh, no, I appreciate you doing that because, yeah, it's not easy, is it? And it's no. pro it, probably, like you said, it's probably good doing it this way. And, um, yeah. So next week we have the lovely Susan Finlay, who is the co-founder of Soul Sanctuary with me. She is another sober sister, um, ex-party animal. So we will hear Susan's story of her alcohol-free life. Um, and then I have another two possibles coming up um as well sharing their sober stories so just getting them booked in for the podcast and i can't wait for you to hear their stories as well so i hope you're enjoying this little mini series do reach out do share the podcast like rate it it really 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 does help me um i would love to get as many people listening as possible or if you're watching on youtube as well please do like the videos and comments because i absolutely love reading um and connecting with you so thank you my darling husband Stuart I will thank see you. you in approximately 30 seconds and for everybody else I will be back next week bye bye